and we can start our uh, event. So good evening, buonasera. Uh, my name is Arianna Danino and I am the cultural events coordinator for the Dante Society of BC. On behalf of our society, I welcome you to, to tonight's event, Dante's Odyssey and Apocalypse Now, a talk by Italian filmmaker Max Leonida. Um, who will take us on a hero's journey from Homer's Odyssey to Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now via Dante's Divine Comedy. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, I would like to welcome to the podium the General Consul of Italy, Mr. Fabio Messineo, who will say a few words. So uh, let me stop sharing the screen. Okay. Thank you, Professor Daniel. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to attend this event organized by the Dante Alighieri Society of Vancouver, to which I stand my thanks for such an, an original way to celebrate the important Dante's anniversary by inviting the filmmaker Max Leonida. Welcome to Vancouver. Ancora benvenuto, maestro. For a, a very interesting presentation about Dante, the Odyssey, and the movie Apocalypse Now. The seventh anniversary since Dante's death is essential for the Italian language and identity. There are over 2 million students of Italian in the world and Italy considers culture and language two priority sector in the promotion of the Made in Italy abroad, together with design, fashion, cuisine, music, and to use one, only one word, the lifestyle that made us famous worldwide. Ulysses, on the other hand, is the first character of Western literature and the first modern man. We feel him close to our experience of the world and of the human condition. A hero who, not by chance, inspired Dante Alighieri and many other important world literature authors. Despite having a fundamental role in universal culture, the stories of Ulysses tell also about a specific area of Italy, Southern Italy that was populated by rich Greek colonies, and that is where I come from. As a matter of fact, I was surrounded by Greek mythology since my childhood. I imagine that the caves close to my town were the place in which Polyphemus and the Cyclops used to live. From my window, I could observe the same sea that Ulysses sailed for 10 years, and the streets where I used to play were named after the mythological characters of the Iliad, and of the Odyssey. The true essence of the Greek mythology and its unlimited energy lie in the willingness of the Greeks to cherish and pass down the most ancient stories of their people, in which they recognize the focal point of their cultural identity, a sort of narrative Big Bang from which the wide variety of modern stories originated, including those narrated in the movies. I'm very curious to learn more about the connection between the two cornerstones of our universal culture through one of the most famous and most discussed movie of the motion picture industry, like Apocalypse Now, by the renowned Italian-American director Francis Ford Coppola. I believe all the participants cannot wait either. Enjoy the presentation and arrivederci. Thank you wow. so much. Thank you so much. And let me just uh, share again my screen for a few more minutes. Um, so I'd just like to, uh, to say a few words to introduce uh, the Dante Alighieri Society of BC, which is, as you probably already know, a nonprofit organization for the uh, promotion of Italian language and culture. Uh, we offer Italian language courses at all levels through our school, the Dante Italian Language School in Vancouver. We also organize courses in Italian conversation, Italian for tourists, as well as short courses on Italian culture, such as the one on the history and anthropology of food, of Italian food. Uh, we also organize a book club in Italian and a bilingual creative writing club in Italian and English. Uh, to honor the fact that we have become, we have nom been nominated uh, a presidium, a literary presidium uh, by the uh, Ita uh, our headquarters in Rome. 
Uh, we strongly encourage you to become members of our society. The yearly membership costs only $30 and gives free access to all our paying events. It's thanks to your memberships and donations that we are able to keep offering our rich calendar of activities. And now let me introduce our speaker, Italian filmmaker and actor Max Leonida, who is joining us from William Penn University in Iowa. Uh, Max toured Europe with his two theater companies and founded the Accademia dello Spettacolo in Milan, an interdisciplinary professional performing arts school with over 35 teachers from all over the world. In 2010, Max moved to the USA and under the head of his production company, Astarox Productions, directed awarded films such as Mandala, Backward, Beauty in the Broken, Memento Mori, A Very Lovely Dress, together with some popular mainstream TV series, Naparazzi, Fai da te facile, on Sky Satellite Network, and countless international commercials, music videos, and documentaries. He is currently film artist in residence at the Communication Research Institute of William Penn University, and as a film director, has several projects in pre-production. Thus, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Max Leonida to our virtual podium. Well, after, I mean, First of all, thank you, Arianna. Thanks very much to the consul, uh, uh, Italian consul in Vancouver. His words are like, uh, I mean, now I got so much weight on my shoulder. <laughs> thank you guys, really. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Arianna. Thank you, Stefano. Hold on. Okay. And uh, I would like to thank, of course, um, also William Penn University, all my staff. I know that some people are connected right now. They're just a bunch of amazing people. And I also want to thank my wife, Paola, because she was the first connection with you, Ayana. And uh, you're both Leo, uh, which is a very, very powerful star sign, fire uh, you know, sign. And uh, you are so able to make things happen and to connect people. So I want to thank also uh, my wife. And thank you. Um, thank you all of you, all the participants, for being here. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let me get into the presentation. And let me share the screen. In the meantime, I, while you are sharing the screen, I would also like to thank Stefano Gulmanelli, the president oh, of yeah. the Dante Society, for being with us as well tonight. Good evening, and thank you. Uh, can you all see the screen, guys? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. So first of all, why this topic? Why this subject? Uh, because um, I know, I mean, Dante Alighieri Society is, uh, is a society that, you know, basically takes care of everything that pertains to the divine comedy, Dante's work, uh, Dante's life. And out there, there are people who know 10,000 times the things that I know, probably, you know, philologist, uh, historic, and uh, I didn't want to compete with them. And let's, let's be honest, since uh, Dante wrote the Divine Comedy, starting with Boccaccio, his first, first biographer, we know so much about Dante Alighieri. We know so many details about his life and his work. So I thought it was more original and more interesting and more intriguing to talk about something uh, a little bit unusual, a little bit more peculiar. And so while I was talking with Arianna and Stefano and my wife was there, we were talking about something. So what could be a nice, interesting topic that we can face, that we can discuss about? It? And um, of trying to bring Dante Alighieri into our modern times uh, and trying to match everything, all the mediums, okay? So literature, vision, uh, painting, uh, filmmaking. And I was like, you know, guys, I think there's a thin line that connects uh, Homer's Odyssey, Dante's Divine Comedy, and Apocalypse Now. 
it looks like they're really, really basically the same story told over and over again with different uh, you know, styles and different approaches. So that's why I'm trying to recreate uh, uh, this kind of journey. So here's a, okay, C can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. So basically here the journey starts and uh, I will guide you through the exploration of a hero's journey. It's a kind of time traveling during this one. And uh, I think uh, that the most important uh, um, feature that we can, uh, we can appreciate tonight is that I will try to debunk many stereotypes and uh, many cliche about the divine comedy and Dante Alighieri in general. That's what I will try to do. First of all, I wanted to create a kind of timeline. So you see exactly and precisely when and where those works were created. 750 years before Christ, you've got Homer's Odyssey. 1320, about, but we know that Dante Alighieri started working on the Divine Comedy way before that, okay? Uh, all his previous work was a kind of preparation. The Vulgar Eloquencia, La Vita Nova, everything was a kind of, a, was a kind of foundation for his a future masterpiece. And then we have 1979, Francis Ford Coppola, Apocalypse Now. This is a very interesting timeline. Somehow, there are like a thousand years of uh, more or less between the three masterpieces. And still, this kind of story, it needs to be told. It's still relevant. It's still powerful. Why is that? Why this kind of story goes so much under our skin and talks to our soul in a such a in a such a powerful way. First of all, let's, uh, because I was talking about debunking, let's talk about the Middle Age. Now, there are so many stereotypes about the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. We all know that, you know, Leonardo Bruni and Flavio Biondo, uh, they were like the first, uh, uh, you know, philosopher who studied the, you know, the Middle Age and basically just with uh, Christopher Keller, also known as Cellarius, uh, in 1670, that was the first uh, milestone that defined the Middle Age as Middle Age. Because before Christopher Keller, people were referring to the Middle Age uh, as something that we, it was just in between uh, the classic beauty of the Roman Empire and then you got the Renaissance and then you got uh, the modern era. But there's something in the middle. There's like a, a thousand years of uh, things happening between uh, those like uh, two big like uh, uh, extremes in our history. How you define them? I believe that defining that time as the dark age is a very, very silly shortcut. It's a level, it's the dark age. Um, so many horrible things. Uh, inquisition, uh, obscurity, in some ways the culture that we used to have in the classic Roman, during the classic uh, Greek and Roman empire uh, and, uh, and the flourishing and the blossoming that we had after during the Renaissance was like uh, clouded in some ways. That is not true at all. The Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, uh, first of all, they're called the Middle Ages from the Latin, medium evum. Età di mezzo, Middle Age. There's a period in our history that we can define as the Middle Age. And in that time, basically, our culture planted all the seeds for what it became after that. So uh, the concept of uh, states, nations, uh, all the modernity was born in the Middle Age. And let's be honest. Uh, Everything that happened in the Middle Age, including, uh, you know, wars uh, and warriors, uh, greedy bankers uh, taking over the power, belligerent kings, uh, the pageants and the villagers who are basically, you know, uh, in a very passive way, just taking, you know, uh, you know, whatever the government or the power of the uh, the church of the emperor that were just basically throwing at them. Uh, in a very, in a very 
passive way and all the political influencer and the religious fanatics. Those were like basically the protagonists of the Middle Age. Is that time so distant from our time? Doesn't sound the bell, the polarization of powers uh, and the words that we're having right now and how some, uh, you know, some points of views, they try to take over some other points of views uh, and how money are ruling the world and how power is handled by some people. I think it's really, really, it, the Middle Age are closer to our time than what we think or we will have to think. So in that particular time, a courageous, extremely independent, he was a very independently intellectual thinker, Dante Alighieri, rises and tries to define his time in a way that nobody ever done before. That is the importance of Dante and the Divine Comedy. He was a, the first independent thinker. Let's remember that the Middle Ages basically are uh, the concept of uh, uh, basically downsize your ego, uh, the opposite uh, of individualism. So the Middle Age are like, uh, uh, the, the, that is the time in which you have to, God is the, only, is the only creature that you can refer to as ego, as someone, as uh, the entity. Your personality should uh, be subdued to that power. You have to be uh, reverent to God. And even painters and writers, basically, they were just, uh, they were basically forgetting to sign their works. Nobody was using their real name. It was a kind of impolite in the time. Dante Alighieri writes the Divine Comedy and fights for the meaning of that work. Um, we will see after what happened with him and uh, the controversial uh, uh, arguments that he created with his work, even with some uh, other writers and some philosophers. Now, let's start with our journey. Now, Odyssey, Divine Comedy, Apocalypse Now. The first thing that they have in common, the beginning of the journey, it's the war. Heraclitus of Ephesus used to say, polemos, polemos, pan pon men pater esti. It means uh, war is the father of everything, or the conflict is the father of everything. Now, do we, I think that we, we should think about that the Odyssey starts right after the Trojan War, 13 or 12th, in the 12th century before Christ. There's a war, the war ends, and right after the war ends, Odysseus starts his, his, his 10 years uh, journey before he's, he goes back to Ithaca, to his own place. The Divine Comedy, that is a historic reference, uh, basically was conceived after the Battle of Campaldino, where Dante fought, bravely fought, uh, and the Guelph party won but the, over the Ghibellines, but the problem is that the party of Guelph, they divided into other parts, the white ones and the black ones. And Dante chose the wrong side because uh, he didn't consider there was a Pope, which he, of course, he places in, in, he places in hell as he should stay because that's the place uh, uh, for people like that, <laughs> we all know. So uh, he chose the wrong side. And he had the, uh, that sentence in Florence. He has to, he, he had to leave Florence overnight with his family because they threatened to kill him. So there's a war even before the divine comedy was conceived. And do we want to talk about Apocalypse Now, which is based on a real war, the Vietnam War. So towards the end of the Vietnam War in 1974, Captain Benjamin Willard is sent on a mission to terminate with extreme prejudice, Colonel Walter Kurtz. So there is a war, there is a conflict. And honestly, there's not uh, a book in history that starts with like, uh, there was a moment of peace, everybody loved each other. Yes, and then what? Conflict, uh, friction, polemos pater panton. Every journey starts with an inner or a real war because that friction generates the purpose of the journey. So 
Let's go to the second chapter. A little advice for the travelers. Now, this is interesting. The Divine Comedy, of course, it's entirely based on a theological concept. So the devil, of course, is in the middle of that. But even if we see and we take a look at the three works, uh, the Odyssey and Apocalypse Now, let's take a look at the real meaning of the devil, the word diabolo, diabolus. The word devil or diabolus or diabolo, as we say in Italian, comes from the Greek verb diaballo, which means uh, separation of the two words. There are two words, there are two universes, uh, and the devil separates them. He is the big separator. He is the divider. No wonder that uh, we're living right now in some diabolical times uh, where everything is so polarized. Again, are the dark ages so far from us? I don't think so. Everything is so polarized. You have to take one side or another. You have to be this or you have to be that. Why can there be some unity? That is the point. War starts with the devil creating some separations. So, and also the concept of um, the vision brings us and carries us to the concept of libel and slander and lie. Why is that? Because the act of lying creates a kind of psychological separation between ourselves and the world. When we lie, we testify a truth which is not, that is not a truth by itself, but it's true for us. We believe, sometimes we believe the lies that we tell to others. So it's interesting how lying, defamation, slander, something that is not true all of a sudden becomes true. Now let's take a look in a deeper way to the Odyssey. Odysseus literally begins his fantastic adventure with one of the biggest lies in the history, the Trojan horse, a lie. The biggest lie we still call the viruses, the Trojan viruses, people sending you viruses through computers or emails or whatever spam, they're called the Trojan. Why is that? Because you present yourself in a friendly way, but in reality, you're bringing death, separation, and destruction. But that was accepted because Ulysses, lives, he lives in another time, and we'll see that later, okay? The times in which Ulysses lives and the times in which uh, the Odyssey was uh, conceived and created are totally different times uh, from Dante's ones. Therefore, lying to survive was uh, basically considered as a kind of merit, as a kind of uh, skill, basically. It is a, a survival skill. Dante begins his immortal masterpiece with the words, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diritta via era smarrita. I lost myself. When I had journey half of life's way, I found myself within the dark forest, for I had lost the path that does not stray. He lost his way. There is a detachment between Dante's convictions and Dante's beliefs and his own life. His life, uh, maybe, he thinks that is a kind of lie. And this is a, such, a, such a modern psychological intuition. Freud starts from there. The dissociation from reality, when you find yourself into the dark forest, it's because you're disconnected from yourself. Everything you've done so far, halfway your, through your life, basically doesn't match your expectations and your dreams and your beliefs. You are in crisis with yourself. Now, of course, everything has to be placed into his times. So we're talking about religions. Uh, we're talking about... Uh, uh, basically theology, okay? He tried to be a good man, but he is a sinner. So the discrepancy 
the crevice between him trying to be a good Christian and he being as a reality, a sinner, that is the problem. Now, Apocalypse Now starts with another kind of lie because when uh, they're briefing the Captain Willard in Natrang before he starts his mission to go find Colonel Kurtz, they're telling basically him a lot of lies. They don't tell him all the truth. They try to convince him to go through this journey, not telling everything about Colonel Kurtz. They only tell him that you have to go there, he went out of his mind, and you have to terminate the person. And let's finish this chapter with the biggest, uh, basically the story of the stories of the world starts uh, with the lie and the devil and the biggest separation of all. The Bible starts uh, with the apple, the snake, the devil. The Genesis, the book of Genesis, the Bible, the beginning of the book of books starts with the man and God being one thing, unity, between the divine and the mortal and the humanity. All of a sudden, there is a separation between the two words, diaballo. And all of a sudden, man becomes conscious of his own uh, mortality. So we see the path. We can see how this kind of blueprint uh, goes through these works, uh, starting from uh, something that is in our DNA. Now, I think uh, this is an important. Um, uh, this is an important key point I have to highlight. Everybody rightly said, uh, "You, Ariana, in the first place, when you promoted the webinar, you say that uh, those are the biggest masterpieces of the Western culture." Now, let's be clear. That is absolutely true. The Western culture is uh, so tightly connected with those masterpieces and these works. Why is that? Because the Eastern culture, especially all the Asian world, they have a completely and different set of mind about everything, about life, death, and what happens after death. So the connection that we have, uh, we as Western society, with those three masterpieces, somehow, maybe, I'm saying maybe, it's something that could be harder to be understood by people living in an Eastern country with a different kind of philosophy and a different kind of concept of life. Let me be clear. <clears throat> so the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or Bardo Thodol, or the Bhagavad Gita, which is the masterpiece of the Hindu culture, they show us how life and death are merely a fluid, interchangeable, and illusional state between many different dimensions. And those who have attained enlightenment are forever released from the, from the materialistic world because it's the desperate attachment and that miserable craving for worldly things that spurs suffering and unease. That is a very Eastern conception of life. The Odyssey, the Divine Comedy, and Apocalypse Now are extremely Western masterpieces. Because even in the afterward, you can still feel that all the suffering and the unease and the, the attachment somehow to our life, it's still there, it's still present, it's still tangible. Because we are shaped that way. That is our culture. We can really separate ourselves from uh, our material life. The Eastern culture and the Eastern philosophy, they're basically based on a different premises and different logic. So I wanna say that because if we have people listening right now from all over the world, let's say we have somebody from, I don't know, Tokyo or somebody from uh, India, they can surely appreciate are Western works and masterpieces, but they are not something that is so pivotal for their cultures as they are for our culture, okay? I, th I thought it was an important key point, this one. Now, let's go into the three works and see why. 
the three works are so important and how they are connected, uh, but in the same time, different from each other. Now, the first journey, the Odyssey, and maybe, Arianna, uh, you keep the record of time. Uh, you told me that there's a kind of break we have to take. Uh, you know that when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm talking, somehow I lose sense of time. So when the moment comes, you let me know, and I will, uh, you know, I will just, uh, you know, shut up for whatever time it takes, and then you can, <laughs> we can. So, uh, let's say that in five minutes, perhaps we can have a first break so that people can also ask questions to the speaker. Of course. Of course. Uh, and we have a break of 10, 15 minutes and uh, we've a, a first Q&A and then Max will keep on uh, on the second, uh, talking about the second part of, of our journey together. Perfect. So I have time in five minutes to go over the first chapter of the first work, the Odyssey. <clears throat> what makes the Odyssey timeless and still relevant masterpiece is the bold, exciting, pre-Christian feeling of infinite hope in life itself, and somehow naive and unconditional trust in the human's ability to overcome all the odds and the hurdles that fate constantly puts on our path. That is a very classic Greek, Roman, ancient, classic conception of life. It is a pre-Christian conception of life. The sense of sin, the sense of guilty, and also, of course, uh, the sense of importance of the afterlife connected to our, to our current life. It's not that present in the culture. Therefore, Odysseus' journey has the exotic flavor of a manly and scrupulous adventure that, because of its own physical nature, doesn't leave much room to philosophical thoughts and self-analysis. The Odyssey is pure adrenaline. It's just fun and excitement, and it's the actual blossoming of, its, of life in its purest and uncontaminated and most amoral form. There is no morality in the Odyssey. The Odyssey is just adrenaline. It's a rush. It's a, it's a man's journey. And it's just something that pertains to our maybe our most primable and ancient instincts. One for all, the survival instinct. That's why we will go after, you know, we will, of course, we will face it after, but uh, let's not forget that Dan Teligieri places Ulysses uh, amongst the liars. Why is that? Because he was a liar. But in the Greek culture, that was not perceived as lying. It was perceived as surviving. Ulysses was a hero to celebrate. Aside from any sense of guilty, sinners and saints, inquisition, that was not a thing in the Greek culture. Therefore, Odysseus doesn't question the God's decisions. He accepts them or fights them. He tries with some tricks, some ingenious tricks, to overcome the hurdles in any way he could. That is something that is so different from the divine comedy. But at the same time, there are some common traits, of course, because even Ulysses goes in the afterward. He has to go, after he visits Circe, he goes to Hades, because he has to basically find answers in the afterlife. But that's just a part of his journey. It's not something that he does because he wants to find some uh, truth about himself. He's not feeling uh, in this, when uh, Ulysses uh, starts his journey, he doesn't feel uh, the same way that Dante Alighieri feels uh, when he starts the Divine Comedy. La diritta via era smarita. I lost my way. It's a different sense, of, it's a different purpose, uh, basically. What moves uh, Ulysses, uh, it's called nostalgia, from two Greek words, uh, nostos algos, the pain of the return, of the longing. 
that is the only engine, that is the only fuel that pushes Ulysses to travel for 10 years before he goes back to Ithaca. Nostalgia, nostos and algos, which is, a, which is a very powerful and beautiful word. But let's not forget that nostalgia, it's not the same uh, purpose that, Dan, that pushes Dante to go through the, his journey. It's a different one, okay? So these are the main differences between uh, the Odyssey and all the other works. And we will we'll see later. Now, I think uh, that uh, five minutes has passed if you want to take a break or if you want me to go over the other chapter. Perhaps, perhaps let's go also to, to the other chapter. Okay. Uh, and, and then, because it's very fascinating, and, and then let's have the question, the QA after the second chapter. Sure. So, the second chapter. Now, the greatness of the divine comedy. Dante was the first writer to depict human beings as the products of a specific time, place, and circumstance, as opposed to the mythic archetypes or a collection of vices and virtues, which was very Greek. Therefore, it could be rightly said that Dante has actually started all the modern fiction. Now, let's take a look at what happened in Dante, Dante's times, why he was writing the Divine Comedy. There were, at, at the very least, other 50 books, more or less shaped and created on the same path and the same blueprint of the Divine Comedy. Uh, we want to mention here, of course, a Bombesin della Riva Libro delle Tre Scritture, which was basically the same structure of the Divine Comedy, Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise, a journey uh, which, which was, uh, because Bombesin della Riva, he was a teacher. He was working in Milan. That's why his name, La Riva, was La Riva di Porta Ticinese in Milan. Uh, so he was a Milanese teacher, and uh, he wrote Libro delle Tre Scritture mainly as a as a kind of school book for his students uh, to learn to learn something about religion. But the shape and the structure was very similar to the Divine Comedy. And let's not forget one of the most uh, <laughs> one of the most uh, problematic writer uh, in Dante's time, which was Cecco d'Ascoli, who basically hated everything about the Divine Comedy. He thought that the Divine Comedy was a horrible book, and Cecco d'Ascoli, who was a physician and a poet, and uh, uh, he was studying astrology, he was studying medicine, uh, one of the parts of his, his book called Acerba, which is a kind of explanation of why the divine comedy is so wrong. There's a point of his book where he says, qui non si canta al mondo delle rane, qui non si canta al, mondo del poeta, al modo del poeta, che finge immaginando cose vane. Qui non si sogna per la selva oscura, lascio le ciance e torno su nel vero, le favole mi fur sempre nemiche. What a stupid guy. I'm sorry. What a stupid guy. How can you how can you literally take the divine comedy and dissect it and say this is wrong? This is not true. It is a work of fiction. Of course, you silly Cecco d'Ascoli. It was a work of fiction, but fiction is the only way that Dante used to express everything, the summa of his culture. Let's not forget the wonderful, immense words of Dante himself when he says, what is the art? What is writing? Writing is verità de ascusa sotto bella menzogna. It is a truth hidden under a beautiful lie. Lie, diaballa. Now, sometimes lying in a very artistic way. And the whole, the entire art in itself is a kind of lie because art doesn't define things as they are. Art has the power to transform things into symbols. Symbol. Now let's consider and let's think about how diavolo and symbolo are both Greek words 
that means completely opposite concepts. Diabolo is from the Greek word diaballo, separation of the words. Simbolo is from the Greek, symbolo, diaballo, symbolo, the conjunction of the words. Symbolo is when two things are matching perfectly and they become one thing that is understandable. So, symbolo is the opposite of diabolo. Now, Dante creates with the Divine Comedy one of the most important symbolic symbolo. He, that's why he has to talk about the devil, because once you understand how the devil separates the words, Dante combines all the three words together, inferno, purgatory, and hell, and our living word, and the word of living ones, and the word of the people who are living in the afterworld. He takes the two hemispheres and pulls them together. We will see that after, but Dante, in a time in which everybody thought that the earth was flat, he said that the earth is the sphere, basically. He says that, not too loud, Let's not forget what happened with some other people who, who dare to say that the earth was not flat in the medieval age. Some people, they got their, their head, <laughs> they lose their head. Some people, they were burned alive. And so he didn't want to go through that kind of stuff, but he knows perfectly Pythagoras philosophy. And Pythagoras, he was the first one basically calculating with, a, with an almost surgical precision uh, uh, the hemisphere of the earth, uh, just putting two sticks of uh, wood in the ground and seeing their shadow in the 24 hours. And with a triangle, Pythagoras, with his calculation, he calculated the perimeter of the earth uh, because the earth was rounded. But, you know, let's not say that to lie. And even today, there are some people who don't believe that entirely. So what can we say? Uh, so let before we break, let me go over the last point to interpret the divine comedy is a scientific textbook it is the biggest mistake that one could make even if dante's genius was able to clearly mention all the implications of a spherical earth so dante had, had he surely had some uh, philosophical physical medical scientific knowledge but he puts all that kind of stuff into the divine comedy in a way that is organic. So we shouldn't take the divine comedy as uh, the silly Cecco d'Ascoli used to, used to do as a scientific textbook, because it's a symbolic book. It's the book that brings back the two, the two universes. I can't hear you, Arianna. Arianna, I can't hear you. Thanks. Sorry. Um, we are at the first break now. So mm -hmm. please feel free to ask questions to Max directly, if you wish, or uh, through the chat. Uh, if you have any comments, doubts, or things you haven't understand or understood, or anything you would like to ask him about this first part, or even the next part of the, of the talk. And... Uh, how it came about, you know, this idea of mixing also genres, because we are we are talking about an epic poem, uh, and and uh, at the end of the spectrum we have a, a movie, you know, of the uh, of the twentieth century. So uh, let me see if there are any questions. I can't see any questions here, but perhaps. Unmute yourself if you wish. If not, perhaps they want really to you, for you to continue, Max, to the next chapter and and have the, the questions at the end. No problem with that. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. I, I, we see a, a question here from Renato. Uh, the, the, the vehicle of a journey to tell a story, the overcoming of many obstacles, seems to be a very popular instrument for engaging an audience. Why do these three journeys stand out in such a special way? Is it the genius of the storyteller or the importance of the message? Beautiful question. Beautiful question. 
uh, now, let me start to answer this very beautiful question. And I, okay, I, I see there's another question. I will, I'm gonna answer this one first. Let me start with a beautiful quote from David Lynch, another filmmaker who used to say, why do people expect art in general to make sense when they accept that life itself doesn't make any sense at all? Now, why this is a kind of answer to this question? Because I don't believe that it's the importance of the message. As a film, oh, bravo. <laughs> As a filmmaker, <clears throat> as a filmmaker, I don't believe in messages. The moment you, not even Dante Alighieri was willing to send any message. He was aware of that. I believe that uh, it's the genius or the talent or the skill, if you want to say so, of the storyteller. We are fascinated by the story because that particular storyteller is able to engage us. And we live the moment in that very moment because we live that. For the same principle for which uh, you can't tell anybody how he felt the first kiss you gave to your lover in your life. You can't tell that, you can't say. If you go to the Holy Mass, if you participate as a Christian or any religious, uh, any religious uh, ritual, if you participate and you're there, and there's a community with you. When you when you exit the church or the or the place where you where the ritual happened, and you try to reproduce and say that you can't, because it's the very moment that defines what happens. The very moment and the beauty of what what happened is the meaning of the thing. So, yes, I'd say somehow that. Um, if you want to use the word genius, of course, uh, but it's the quality of the storyteller that uh, engages us and creates uh, that kind of importance. Uh, let's not forget that Homer, he basically collected stories and myth and, uh, and uh, anecdotes. They were basically a kind of a common culture in the, Greek, uh, in the Greek time, in the Greek empire. He just brought everything together, gave a kind of shape to the story, and he brought everything together into the Odyssey. Dante Alighieri, he did the same thing. He, he took everything, all the knowledge of his time and the time before him, and he melted everything together, creating this beautiful statue called the Divine Comedy. Same thing, Francis for Coppola. Our modern culture, the 70s, whatever happened before him and what could happen after that, he merged everything together in an orgy of wonderful images. So we enjoy the show, we enjoy the story because the storyteller is able to put everything together in a magnificent way. Now, if any of us wants to find a message or a moral, or something like that, that is up to us. And of course, everybody is absolutely free. Everybody is absolutely free to find that message in the story, okay? Absolutely. But in the same time, uh, let's not forget that the story is beautiful only because of its story, of the story itself, and because the narrator was able to engage us. That's what I think, very humbly, to answer your question. Thank you, Max. We have also a question from Carmelinda. Fascinating sí. talk. Do you use these hero journey ideas into your films? <clears throat> maybe, uh, maybe unconsciously I do. Uh, of course, because I am a Western, uh, you know, yeah, I, my, my, that's my culture, you know. I'm a Western guy, and all my culture is based on, the, again, the classic Roman and Greek culture, and then on the medieval age, and then whatever comes after. 
So because even if I'm absolutely fascinated by all the Eastern culture, but as a matter of fact, I would lie to myself. You know, I would say, I would never, I don't know, I would never be, I would never be a, I think, I think, I would never be a very good Buddhist monk, even if I, maybe I would love to, because that really doesn't, doesn't speak to the very heart of my culture and to the very heart of my DNA and what I am. I feel connected to this kind of story. And so maybe very unconsciously, uh, very unconsciously to answer the question, uh, the hero's journey, I think it's the blueprint uh, for so many other works, uh, not just my works maybe, but many other works. Uh, and again, getting back to Her Heraclitus, Polemos Pater Pantum, uh, the friction and the war and the conflict is father of everything. So basically the hero, the hero always faces conflict in his life and on his path. Therefore, I think that it's a kind of blueprint for my work. I believe so, yes, yes. And then we have a question from Stefano. Yeah. I return to the centrality of war that you have emphasized in the three works. The most execrated human activity more rightly considered useless seems to be the starting point of every human experience of deep transformation. What a paradox, what a dramatic condemnation of man. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, um, Stefano. That, that, is, that is a very beautiful, uh, very beautiful point, and I couldn't agree more with that. But if we think carefully about that, Stefano, why is the war the beginning of everything? Why is the conflict and war with its, uh, you know, with its uh, a lot of drama and blood and injustice and crime and horror? Why? Well, I instinctively think about Albert Camus, the French writer, who wrote a wonderful uh, book called La Peste, the Plague, and uh, which is very timely right now because of the COVID and everything. And uh, even if the COVID uh, was not basically like uh, you know the bubonic plague that uh, inflict you know afflicted uh, uh, the European towns in the medieval age, I think that the concept of the book, the concept of what Albert Camus so wonderfully put down in his novel. Uh, it also, can also apply to the war, the concept of war. War, because of its nature, basically brings up everything, the best and the worst of ourselves. In a time of real conflict, I'm not talking about these fake wars that are happening here and there, which are basically a caution to allow the 15, 20, wealthy percent of the population of the world still live in their beautiful way and keep the rest of the world living in their horrible way so that our society can proceed the way it proceeds. I'm not talking about this kind of wars. I'm talking about war. When the war strikes and hits you in your very place and all of a sudden you have no certainty anymore, no house, no friends, you don't know what's going on around you. In that very case, like uh, in our Berkham U novel, The Plague, you can really see who's brave and who's not. Uh, you can really see who's true and who's false. Uh, in a, in, on, on a, on a immensely, on a uh, smaller scale, on a very, very, very smaller scale, I'd say that when I was in the army, because back in my days, I have to be, I was a bersaliere, so I, it was mandatory back in my days when I was in Italy. So uh, one day I got the infamous, you know, pink letter from uh, the government. I had to leave and have to go to the army uh, for a year, and I was a bersaliere. Now, on a very, very smaller scale, when you are in the army, what's the purpose of an army? To make a war, basically, or to fight a war. So we are soldiers. We have to fight, allegedly. Now, on a smaller scale, I remember vividly my first month uh, when I was training to be a bersagliere in the barrack. And I remember clearly people uh, who were like so, you know, uh, 
proud of themselves and so cocky, arrogant, you know, bodybuilders and everything, crying like babies at night. Basically, not even the war itself, but just being a warrior or being in a barrack for a month brought up their real nature. So why war? Because war brings up everything. No wonder that there's a war at the beginning of the Odyssey. There's a battalion, de Cal there's a war in the Battalion of Calpaldino at the beginning of the Divine Comedy. And uh, Apocalypse Now is basically happening during a war because war brings up everything. Who we really are, you cannot lie. You're gonna be who you're gonna be. So that's, I think, the explanation for how horrific it is. What a paradox, you're so right, Stefano. I couldn't agree more with that, but that's the only way you can really see the true colors of people. <clears throat> uh, there's another question you wanna, re you wanna read it, Arianna? It's the last one, I think, here. Uh, it's about Alida. I think it, she's referring also to the first question about whether it's the genius or the message. And she says, could it also be the beauty of the work the storyteller has created? The work itself is its own entity apart from the creator. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> that's something that, uh, of course, again, in a very smaller scale as a filmmaker, um, there's a moment uh, where, <clears throat> for how painful it is, you have to separate yourself from your work. You make a movie, you write a book, you write a poetry, you paint, you do something. And uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's crazy because it's, uh, I, I don't know how it feels, my wife can tell you for sure, but I don't know how it feels to give birth to a baby. She did, of course, and I, I envy her so much for that immense, wonderful feeling that I would never be able to feel as a man. But uh, when you give birth to your creation as a filmmaker, there's a moment in which you have to just take distance from your work and let it go by itself. And that moment is painful. And then your work will be criticized, judged, uh, praised, insulted. Uh, one of the most painful moments is when you're sitting in a theater, I mean, as a filmmaker, of course, and you see a movie and there's a premiere and everybody's watching and you got the critics and you got the journalists and you got your friends or your fake friends, everybody's sitting there and you're just there, oh my gosh, what are they gonna say about my movie? Are they gonna love it or not? But it's not, and you say my movie, no, it's not your work. It doesn't belong to you anymore. The Divine Comedy, it's a, it's a word heritage right now. Of course it's Dante, but once Dante did his work, then the divine comedy just walks away. So yeah, of course, uh, uh, the artwork, uh, it's something that lives by itself, absolutely. Oh yes, Pamela. <laughs> oh, my lovely Pamela. Of course you can quote me, my darling. Yes, War brings up everything. She's a, she's a wonderful casting director. Yeah. She's a, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think you, you can go on with the third part of your talk uh, and the, sure. the third, yes, uh, section of your journey. Absolutely. Okay. So we were here. And uh, now, after we faced uh, uh, the Libro delle Tre Scritture and uh, the Divine Comedy, let's, uh, let's jump to the next chapter, which is, of course, uh, Apocalypse Now. Okay, first of all, Apocalypse Now was initially conceived and created as a kind of uh, loosely based uh, movie uh, uh, on uh, Joseph Conrad's novel called Heart of Darkness. And by the way, uh, the making of and the whole backstage of how Francis Ford Coppola made Apocalypse Now and uh, almost, uh, and now I say this, you know, smiling and I should have probably because uh, Francis Coppola, he almost killed himself while he was filming Apocalypse Now. Uh, the creation and the production of the movie was so difficult and so troubled and so full of problems that uh, financial problems, of course, on top of everything. 
but uh, anything, anything you can imagine from uh, the set that they created uh, in Philippines, of course, they could, because they couldn't film anything in Vietnam in the real place. Uh, so they went to the Philippines, uh, which was, of course, a friendly country uh, to the United States. So they had to film everything in the Philippines. And uh, uh, right after the set was prepared and everything was beautifully decorated, uh, a storm, you know, the monsoon, they arrived there. And so uh, basically there's been a, a, a a terrible storm and in 48 hours uh, the entire set has been destroyed like literally destroyed there was nothing more there and um, so from this technical and very practical problems to <laughs> Marlon Brando who was basically paid in full for playing colonel courts uh, and uh, he decided to not show up and he sent back in those days we're talking about telefax uh, he sent a fax uh, uh, to um, Coppola, who was working in the Philippines, and uh, uh, he said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't feel like I can make this movie. Basically, the only reason was because uh, he gained a lot of weight. Uh, he felt he was too fat to play that role, and he didn't like, he didn't like himself, uh, and he didn't want to appear in the movie in that way. And so even if he was a big friend of Coppola, because they already worked together on The Godfather, and and the movie did very well, actually. <laughs> so they had, a, they had like a very positive experience together. Uh, Marlon Brando was paid in full, again, paid in full, just sent a telefax to Coppola and said, I'm not gonna show up on the set, I'm sorry, find someone else. But you know, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna keep the money because I need the money. So <laughs> at that point, Coppola went back to Warner Brothers and said, guys, can you give me some money to finish the movie? And Warner Brothers told him, hey, Listen, you already spent a lot of money for this, this, and that, and now you're wasting money on that, you know, crazy guy. I'm sorry. Now you got to, you gotta, you gotta put the money in your pocket, and that's what he did. As a guarantee, he gave his own mansion. He had a beautiful mansion. I don't, I don't know the value, like several millions of dollars. Uh, as a collateral, he gave his his house. If the movie didn't do well at, 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 in theater, probably he would have lost his house and everything which he didn't, of course, because the movie was an instant success. But um, the thing is, uh, so all these kind of problems uh, created uh, a very, very terrible mood on the set. And there's a beautiful, beautiful uh, documentary uh, by Eleanor Coppola, his wife, uh, called Heart of Darkness, because uh, the original concept was uh, to, to, to basically translate uh, Heart of Darkness into a feature film in a modern movie. Now, the more Francis was working on the script and was working on the movie, the more it was clear to him and his collaborators that the movie was a, getting very, very close to a kind of divine comedy vibe. And he admitted that in many interviews. So this epic war masterpiece is the arrival point of an artistic and spiritual thread that connects Homer's Odyssey, Dante's Divine Comedy, and Coppola's Apocalypse Now. Their intimate connection is so strong that we could uh, definitely draw an imaginary line that you saw basically in the beginning of my presentation. And uh, that line basically shows us how a work that was done way before Christ, a work that was done in the Middle Age and a work that was done a few years ago, they're so connected because they still speak to our very hearts and our souls. Now, let's uh, take a step back. And very much like uh, in the same time in which Dante Alighieri wrote the Divine Comedy, they were, there were some uh, divine comedies running through Europe uh, similar books, similar concepts, uh, 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 the journey of a man into the three realms, uh, Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise. There were some other divine comedies running around. In the same way, it's so interesting that in 1979, when Apocalypse Now was released, other film, similar movies uh, were theatrically released. Let's think about The Warriors by Walter Hill. Let's think about Mad Max by George Miller. 
And a few years after, in 1981, John Carpenter escaped from New York. The journey of a solitary man through a realm that could be defined as a kind of inferno, as a kind of hell. He has to go through different, different phases and different uh, stages. Now, before, okay, let's go through uh, um, uh, the common traits and then I wanna, I wanna add something that is not in the presentation, but I think it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. Now, what do they have in common? Many things. The solitary hero's journey, the travel's companions. It's a solitary journey, but you need somebody to travel with you, at least for a certain, a certain uh, uh, part of the path. You need somebody to be with you. You cannot do everything by yourself. You can be entirely alone on the, on the path. Dante can be alone at all. Ulysses can be alone at all. And even um, Captain Willard, he's not alone in his path. So you need some travel companions. The longing to return to an original place where we belong. And then the final redemption that happens in different ways in our different works. Now, to somehow get back to the question that somebody asked me before, you know, about the, the journey of the hero and why it's so, it's so speaking to us still nowadays, it's so timely, it's so pertinent, even right now. Let me tell you something, video games. Video games are the blueprint of the hero's journey. I mean, at least the, most of the video games right now, really from uh, Assassin's Creed to um, what's the other, uh, Grand Theft Auto, uh, the blueprint for every video game is that you have basically one protagonist who goes through stages, stages and uh, phases and stages of the path that he have to go through to arrive to a final point. He gains, he gains points or energy or whatever through his path. He finds people, some people are his companion. Video games are based on this pattern. So, even before we go back to the original scene and the devil and everything, don't we think that our entire life is based on this? Because that's our DNA. Our life is basically a journey where the destination, it's not the real destination. It is the journey itself, the destination. Now, our life is a path and to quote Salvatore Quasimodo, ognuno sta solo sul cuore della terra, trafitto da un raggio di sole ed è subito sera. Ognuno sta solo. And I will have to quote also Eugenio Montale, one of my most favorite poet ever. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize for poetry and literature. Eugenio Montale says, forse un mattino andando in un'area di vetro arida, Rivolgendomi, vedrò compirsi il miracolo, il nulla dietro di me, il vuoto alle mie spalle con un terrore di ubriaco. Poi, come su uno schermo, s'accamperanno di getto albe di case e colli per l'inganno consueto, ma sarà troppo tardi. E io me ne andrò solo fra gli uomini che non si voltano col mio segreto. The sense of solitude of our journey it's present in our entire culture. And, for, and think about that. When we are born, we are in good company. Our mother, of course, is there. Our parents are there. Everybody's cheering. When we leave this path, when we leave this planet, we're alone. Most of the times, unfortunately. So this is the meaning of the path. Our life is the, the hero's journey. That's why we feel so connected. It is a blueprint that is rooted in our very essence, in our very life. It reflects it basically everything we do in our life. We see ourselves in this path because that is our entire path. So no wonder that everything from video games to the three biggest masterpieces of the Western culture, 
we see, we feel a connection immediately right away. Now, of course, there are storytellers and storytellers with capital S. So according to how people are, are able to tell the story, then we are fascinated and we can follow them. Uh, even Padre Davide Maria Turoldo used to say that, uh, you know, the path of our life is so interesting because we are born and we come here from a situation of, uh, that we didn't know, but we jump into this world and all of a sudden everything is there and then we live this world in a very lonely way. So this is the path. Basically, it is the blueprint of our path on this planet. Arrival, the beginning of the journey, our path, companions, friends, foes, enemies, partners, happiness, suffering, and then you leave this planet and you arrived. But the arrival point, it's not the real the arrival point. It's not the purpose of your journey. The purpose of your journey is being here, right here, right now, sharing every second with everybody who's with you. So getting back, so the three masterpieces, video games, our life, take everything together and you will see how it, everything matches. It's the kind of puzzle and every piece magically falls into the right place and you see how everything makes sense at certain point. Now, the biggest difference between Coppola's masterpiece, Dante Alighieri's work and uh, uh, Homer's Odyssey. We are in a crazy time. I said in the beginning how you know everything is polarized and uh, how everything sometimes makes sense or doesn't make sense at all. Biggest difference between uh, Coppola's work and his journey and not and the other two, it's a very important difference. We have the Greek adrenalinic enthusiasm in the beginning of our path with Homer. We have, uh, of course, uh, the sense of sin and guilty, but uh, at the same time, the sense of redemption and the aspiration to something higher and better and something holy in Dante's path. When we arrive to Coppola's journey, all of that is gone. This is our modern culture, nihilism. It's a very cynical culture. We don't believe in anything anymore. Insanity and meaningless are the only arrival point of the hero's journey. So Coppola's movie is the representation of a world where both the classic Greek adventure spirit and the medieval theological purpose have disappeared. They're not here anymore. The protagonist of Coppola's movie is forever lost in his own insanity. And the arrival point, colonel courts, represents the absurdity of our godless life. It is a pure nightmare. There's nothing more and nothing less than that. A void. And that's, and that's what makes Coppola's movie different from the other, the other two. Now, now that we have seen uh, similarities and also, of course, differences between the three masterpieces, uh, let's see how they are interconnected with each other because that's the purpose of our webinar today. Okay, so. Let's start with the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Odysseus, he goes to hell, exactly like Dan Caligari in the Divine Comedy and Captain Willard in Apocalypse Now. All three of them go to hell. Uh, Odysseus approaches Circe to ask for help returning home. She tells him that uh, he must first travel to Hades to speak with the ghost of the blind prophet Theresius. She explains that Theresius will tell you the way to go, stages of your voyage, how you can cross the swirling sea and reach home at least. Eager to return to his home and family in Ithaca, Odysseus follows Circe's detailed instruction to reach Hades, where the souls of the dead dwell. Now, you see that even in this case, there are no theological implications. 
his journey to hell is only functional to his getting back home. Survival mode, survival mode, pure adrenaline. He doesn't do that because he needs some kind of redemption or some kind of knowledge about hell itself or the afterlife. It's okay. It's the Greek culture. It's the initial blossoming part of our life and our culture. Now, we're up to Dante Alighieri. Of course. I mean, more interconnected than, you know, than Dante's work and the artist said there's nothing like that because uh, he definitely talks about the Ulysses in his work. Inferno 26 shows us Ulysses not in the mode of sarcasm or irony, but in a tragic, heroic, flawed greatness. The author does not intend to cut his hero down to size, and Odysseus has a wholly unique status among sinners. That is true. Dalla cintola in su tutto il vedrai. That is the, the first description of Ulysses. Even if he's like burning into this life, eating him alive, you can still see his imposing figure in hell. The hell is a place where people are screaming, uh, you know, terrified. It's a place of horror. And all of a sudden, someone stands. Again, dalla cintola in su tutto il vedrai. It's like a statue. That's how reverent. Dante is toward Ulysses. He celebrates Ulysses' greatness because he can see that greatness. Ulysses has a sustained presence in the poem. He is named in each canticle, not only in Inferno 26, but also in Purgatorio 19, where the siren of Dante's dream claims to have turned Ulysses aside from his path with her song. And in Paradise 27, where the pilgrim looking down at earth sees the trace of Il Barco Folle di Ulysses. Now, think about the epitaph, the last words that Dante says about Lisa, how beautiful, how reverent, how magnificent they are. Tre volte il fe girare con tutte l'acque, alla quarta levar la poppa in suso e la prora ira in giù come altrui piacque, infinché il mar fu sovra noi richiuso. The sea becomes a tomb becomes the grave of Ulysses, the ocean itself. That is the last grandeur, the last beautiful grand gesture that Dante gives to Ulysses as a kind of tribute to his greatness. So we have the real greatness in the Greek time. We have the reverence, though, although if Dante has to place, of course, Ulysses in hell, because he's a liar and he was a, he was okay with that. But, and then we jump to the last and most ominous and terrifying ending of all. The structure and the feeling of Apocalypse Now is very similar to Dante's Divine Comedy. We have a man going through an emotional and existential journey. Dante sees the hierarchy of sin, punishment, redemption, and damnation, just like Dante's Inferno. Willard's journey passes through some type of cycles. Willard, in Apocalypse Now, every stage is a kind of circle. And if you see the movie, he goes deep. Uh, even visually, the opening of Apocalypse Now, think about the opening. The wood uh, with the nap on, all the helicopters and everything is getting fired. So the opening of the movie is like, the, the lenses are wide. You can see big frames of establishing shots, wideness, everything is huge. And, and the more the movie gets into the darkness, uh, it gets wide, it gets uh, thinner and thinner. And it's a kind of funnel until the point where you only have his face, Colonel Kurz, the closest of the closest up that he can make with the frame. So wideness in the beginning, and then it becomes a narrow, narrow, narrow to the point that we have no escape. We are in the heart of darkness. We meet Satan himself, the big divider, the liar. Now, uh, the devil is the face of hell, just like Kurtz represents what the hell truly is, lies, sins, temptations, and the seductive thirst Transgression. In Apocalypse Now, Kurtz, it's Saturn in the last circle. So 
see how everything is so greatly interconnected, how those three works are really tied together on a thematic level, on a philosophical level, on a imaginary level. You don't believe me? Take a look at this. These are just frames and pictures. Uh, the upper part and lower part. So you see three just random frames. Of course, uh, the Odyssey, it's, uh, you know, it's the most, they've done movies, TV series, and whatsoever, but the Odyssey. Apocalypse Now is a movie. The Divine Comedy, interesting. Not many people made a movie about the Divine Comedy. As a matter of fact, you can find it on YouTube. I can send you the link if you want it when, when um, to all the participants. I can send the link to Ariana and she can share with everybody. There's a beautiful uh, documentary about Federico Fellini. And one of his assistants, he says that uh, for all his career, Federico Fellini was teased with a multi-million contracts from the American producers. They were trying to force him and convince him to make a movie about the Divine Comedy. And Federico Fellini always refused to do that. You know why? Because first of all, he was an intelligent man. Secondarily, because he knew that the Divine Comedy, unlike the Odyssey, and of course, Apocalypse Now, it's irrepresentable. You can, everything is there. The moment you try to translate uh, Dante's words into something else, uh, you lose something. The work is there, the imagination, and even the language itself. I try with some uh, foreign friends, American friends, uh, friends from every country, to recite the divine comedy in their language with translations. It doesn't work. It has to be said in Italian. Dante's language, it's almost edible. You chew the words. His language is powerful. Even the words and uh, the sound of the words, they reproduce something that is uh, absolutely not translatable into any other media. But because I'm, because I'm a nice guy and I try to put some reference and visual reference here, so you see that the Odyssey, <clears throat> look at the frames, the first three ones on the upper level, the Odyssey, Polyphemus, and then you have the Divine Comedy, the big devil, and then you have Apocalypse Now. You know, see how they're looking so much alike, the composition of the frame, and uh, the environment itself. Look at the environment, the Odyssey, the Divine Comedy, and Apocalypse Now. Somehow, if you close your eyes and think about the Odyssey, the Odyssey has a kind of red color. Why is that? Because of course, uh, it's all, it's, red is the color of life, it's color of blood, it's a color of action, adventure. It, it is an active color, it's a violent color. The divine comedy, you think about the inferno, but as a matter of fact, blood, the blood of Christ is red. So you think about the divine comedy and even the, the divine comedy has a kind of red color. Apocalypse now, the entire wonderfully master uh, cinematography created by Vittorio Storaro, it, it's a, it is entirely on a red palette of colors. Now, before we arrive to almost the end of our journey, this beautiful quote from Purgatory. Vien dietro a me, lascia dir le genti, sta come torre ferma che non crolla, giammai la cima per soffiar di venti. Wow. Follow me and let the people talk, firm as a tower remain, which never shakes its top, however hard the winds may blow. These words should be the creed, they should be the motto for everybody who wants to decently and honorably live, even in our times, the firmness. Vien dietro me e lascia dir le genti. Sta come torre ferma. Follow me and at the same time be firm. Now, this was like, this. I believe that this summarized somehow the entire Dante's philosophy. 
his way of thinking, a kind of shifting point. And uh, why is a shifting point? Because he was always himself, but in the same time, always changing himself. All the encounters in the Divine Comedy, Paolo Francesca, Brunetto Latini, Ulisse, Farinata degli Uberti, Il Conte Ugolino, Dante cries, Dante faints, Dante laughs. Every time he has human reactions and human feelings, and he changes his feelings according to the people he's meeting. But in the same time, he never loses his faith and his point of view. This, this kind of uh, extremely coherent point of view, it's something that we should learn in these times in which people are so frequently changing mind, ideas, and flags, and creeds, and beliefs. And today, it's this is trendy, so we're going to do this, and tomorrow. No. Why? You are yourself. Be proud of that and just be firm. And it doesn't mean to be stubborn. It just means know who you are and be like a tower, but in the same time, follow what you have to follow because that's your belief. And this summarizes, I believe, like really the essence of Dante Alighieri. Now, and this is the end. So why? The Divine Comedy is still one of the greatest and most relevant works of art. And if I may say something about the three masterpieces without taking anything away from the other two, I love the Odyssey, I adore Apocalypse Now, I love all three of them. But still, in my mind and in my heart, and of course, this is a very personal, uh, uh, subjective opinion. But I believe that the divine comedy stands like a beacon amongst all the others. Why? Very simple. Style perfection. The entire comedy is written in the style of a poem that can be contained in a book of almost 150 pages, where very verse has the same number of syllabus and all the verses of the entire masterpiece are grouped in blocks of three. Think about the grammar, the structure, Grammar, structure, and style. He was able to contain everything in a very limited cage and structure, and yet he was able to define an entire universe. When people are complaining, I mean, as a filmmaker, you know, oh, I don't have the lenses and the camera. Uh, this is digital, but you know, that is a 4K. I got a 2K. Start complaining. If you're able to tell a masterpiece, if you're a good writer or a good filmmaker, you can film everything with this phone and it works and it's beautiful. It's how you use your means and your tools. Dante, he was mastering his tools in a, in a, in a probably unmatched way. Poetical beauty. Despite all the formal constraints, Dante was able to make it unbelievably beautiful and literally every single terzina, you know that terzina, are, are the typical uh, way that Dante places verse in the Divine Comedy. Actually, someone said that a man could lock himself in a cave for years with only one Dante's verse or one Dante's Tertina. And if you read the same Tertina every day, you can still find new meanings in the same Tertina for years. That's how deep, that's how profound Dante's work is. Polysemic meaning, which is something that Dante liked very much because he started talking about the polysemicità dei sensi delle scritture in the vulgar eloquencia. Other than being formally stunning and aesthetically superb, Dante made the divine comedy extremely dense of meaning and significant symbols because along his journey, he meets a staggering number of souls. For example, the Saladin, Aristoteles, Julius Caesar, Odysseus, Plato, Judah, and hundred more. Spiritual depth. When you study the divine comedy, you basically are studying history of literature, of art, of humanity, all at once, with thousands of direct and indirect references to historic events, figures, and facts. It is a common use amongst philologists to define Dante's work as la summa, you know, many times when you refer to the divine comedy, you say la summa. It's called la summa's work. 
because that is actually the sum of the entire Western knowledge. No doubt about it. Language modernity, regardless of being Italian or not, of course, I'm Italian, I, I love Dante's language, but Dante's language has a magnetic, mesmerizing, captivating power that can seduce even foreign language speaking people. And of course, visual somethingness, one of the reasons for which it's so hard to translate, to translate uh, uh, Dante's words into images, film, painting, or whatsoever. It's because uh, the visual impact of the divine comedy, it's so overwhelmingly powerful that any translation, as I said before, can only be a pale and lame representation of his masterpiece. And this is the end of our journey. And uh, this is the end of our journey for the moment, of course. Uh, I tried to contain myself and I tried to just put something, uh, some hints, uh, uh, some references and some, of course, uh, uh, basic information here. Uh, you understand that to go deeper into this kind of topic, uh, it would require like not just a couple of hours, but it would require like maybe a couple of months and maybe even a couple of years, of course. Uh, um, I don't think that any of you has the time to stay here two years uh, uh, uninterruptedly uh, listening to me ranting about this and that. So uh, this is what I came up with, and I hope you appreciated it. If you have any question, I'm open right now. Thank you, Max. A very interesting journey that we have together you. with you. Absolutely. I think they really enjoyed it, uh, all of us. Uh, we have some comments and some questions sure. uh, while you were talking. For example, Renato uh, mentioned, uh, didn't Martin Sheen also have a heart attack during filming? So during the filming of Apocalypse Now. So among all the troubles that Coppola yes. went through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. He had a heart attack. And two little things, uh, two little, you know, for, you know, <clears throat> the movie buffs like me here, uh, uh, two little things. The first one is that yeah he had a heart attack and it wasn't it wasn't a mere, it wasn't a mild heart attack it was a very bad one uh, they had to drag him to hospital and everything and of course another time in which the the production has to be uh, put on pause and whatsoever so and in post production sorry someone said something <laughs> oh yeah the post production just the helicopter scene, the, the Valkyrie scene, took one year and three months to be edited. Just that part of the movie. Uh, Walter Murch, uh, uh, Francis Coppola's editor, his wife uh, had cancer while he was editing uh, uh, Apocalypse Now, and uh, he had to transfer all his editing station, which was in Warner Brothers back in those days, uh, to his home, and that was the first very beginning of uh, digital editing because they had to transfer everything on a digital platform with all the pricing that you can imagine. So editing, post-production, heart attack. By the way, in the beginning of the movie, when you see Martin Sheen uh, um, having uh, this kind of crazy moment, he's on drugs, he's drunk, he breaks uh, a mirror with his fist. He really did that. Basically Coppola, uh, Martin Sheen was on drugs for real in that moment. He was he was on drugs. He was high, and uh, Coppola filmed everything. And he said, "Martin, do whatever you feel, whatever you want, no limits." He broke his hand, and the blood you're watching the movie it's his real blood. Now, if you if you would do something like this, uh, something like that right now, uh, lawsuits, uh, unions. Uh, I mean, you're gonna start the movie like after five minutes. We're talking about 1978 and uh, uh, filmmaking was a uh, kind of another thing back in those, day, in those days. So basically everything or almost everything was allowed. So not just the Martin Sheen's are attack, but many things you see in the movie happened for real. Crazy stuff that was happening for real. 
Uh, and then Stefano commented on when you were talking about video games and the hero's journey and the fact that they are like a blueprint of the hero's journey. But then he said, but life contrary to video games has no reset button. I don't know. Uh, how... Okay, but <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and that's what, and that's, uh, that is the only thing that of course makes video games dangerous. It's not the violence or whatever, come on. I grew up with the you know fairy tales from the Greens Brothers uh, and the Yogurts uh, and and uh, uh, and Barba Blue and his wife and you know the, the people dying in the most horrible ways, uh, uh, horrible and gory fairy tales uh, has been told to children since the beginning of times. Uh, it's not that the bad point of video games. It's not the violence. Uh, unfortunately, even if I'm not a fan of violence, of course, uh, violence is a part of life. The issue with video games is that they give you the illusion that you can restart, which you can't. I mean, of course, you can reborn your life, you can have a second chance, but if you die, you die for real. And that's what some crazy mass shooters uh, don't realize. They don't realize that uh, the POV first person, you know, video game, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, point of view it's not something that you can apply in your life if you go around with an ak-47 you start shooting people the people have died there's no reset button they don't realize that's the only dangerous things about video games they give you the idea you can restart but you can't so that's a good point linda was asking do you have examples of women in hero's journey was mary mother of jesus and on a hero's journey okay uh well this is a... Uh, uh, and then yeah. Susie Leblanc uh, uh, says, okay, let's think about Didone, Eleonora of Aquitaine, or Joanne of Arc. Of uh, course, yeah, examples absolutely. Examples of women's journey too. Absolutely. Now, um, let's not forget, <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a very delicate and sensitive uh, topic. Why is that? Because um, it, it's a matter of fact that culture has been in the hands of men rather than women for centuries. Uh, Every story, I said something very, very specific uh, at the beginning of my analysis of the Odyssey. It is a manly adventure. It's a bunch of friends. It's a bunch of bodies getting together. And we go after the war of Troy. And you know, after we won everything with the Trojan horse, we're gonna spend another 10 years uh, having fun around and everything. So that's, it's a bunch of guys, okay? So it's a, it's a man's story. And unfortunately, because culture, it is what it is. It's always been told from a man's perspective. Um, we can think about, uh, we're talking about Greek literature. We can think about Sappho. Uh, I mean, her poems were so wonderful and so beautiful. Uh, but of course, uh, there are some woven's journey. But uh, uh, you mentioned here, of course, Didone, Eleonora da Quitania. Uh, Giovanna Dar, Joanna of Arc, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about in the medieval culture, Hildegard von Bingen. Uh, she was writing wonderful songs uh, and she basically created the mother together with um, the Gregorian code. He, she created basically the mother sense of music, uh, polyphonic chants and everything. So there are examples in history a woman's uh, journey uh, as the hero. But uh, again, that is a very sensitive part topic. And of course, what's happening right now is a kind of cultural revolution. And I'm really glad about that because uh, as a matter of fact, as a filmmaker, I always loved women's characters. As a matter of fact, I find them more interesting than men characters. And let's not forget, we were talking about the man's hero's journey. But uh, Ulysses, what's his purpose? He has to get back to Penelope, Ithaca. He's getting back to his wife because that's where his life is. And Dante Alighieri, Dolce Novo, La Donna Angelicata, Beatrix is the purpose of his whole journey. So there is a feminine presence, strong feminine presence throughout the whole work of this man. 
and uh, when uh, uh, people uh, you refer to Mary, mother of Jesus, uh, it's interesting uh, how we pray Mary, we love Mary, we know she's the mother of Christ, uh, but as a mother, uh, you know, Father uh, pa um, uh, Padre Madre da David Maria Turoldo, he used to say, Mary, she says just a few words throughout the entire gospel, and yet. Her presence is so strong. So sometimes we don't really need to say so much to get that kind of importance. And, um, but of course, it's a, it's, it's a good question, this one. I believe that right now, more and more, um, and of course, let's not forget, I'm, now I've been talking only about these three masterpieces. But while I was working on this webinar, what about, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And what about uh, James Joyce, Ulysses, which was a masterpiece that was received as the most horrible book when it came out, when it was published. Virginia Woolf defined Ulysses Joyce as one of the worst book ever, ever made. Because people were not ready for that kind of masterpiece. So there are so many references with the hero's journey and we can see, we can see how that kind of blueprint basically like, like, a, like a trace of DNA. It's, it's basically a trace of DNA reproducing itself through our entire culture over and over and over again. We can't escape that. And there is Stefano who has a comment about the, the you know, the kind of sequence from uh, Homer's Odyssey uh, through Dante and then the Apocalypse Now. Isn't it that the sequence of the three somehow represents the seasons of man, the adrenaline rush of youth, the realization of sin and possible redemption of maturity, and finally the creeping nihilistic disillusionment of old age? Beautiful, beautifully said, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, does that mean that right now we are on the verge of the end of our society? Because according to what you say, and I agree with you, of course, uh, according to what you say, basically, the Greek ancient culture, the classic Greek culture was the beginning of everything. So you have that, uh, you know, bold and, uh, uh, adrenaline of rush and then you have the maturity of Dante's work that's why I love Dante's work more than the other two because I believe that uh, in terms of balance between energies uh, it's the most mature and the, and the most maturely done uh, is uh, Francis Ford Coppola's masterpiece uh, the reflection uh, of the older and the final stage of her life maybe uh, absolutely uh, does that mean, Stefano, that we are on the verge of the end of our society? I don't know, maybe, probably. At the same time, uh, at the same time, I love to think because, you know, I can help myself. I love happy endings and I'm a positive person. And I love when the stories, they end in a positive way. By the way, that's why we call the divine comedy, comedy. Because unlike tragedy, tragedy starts well and ends bad. Comedy starts very bad and ends very well. That's, that was the definition basically in the medieval age. So that's what we call the comedy. And the uh, word divine was uh, added by Boccaccio, who was one of the most uh, uh, you know, reverent uh, uh, Dante's fan. Now, I believe that uh, even if you reach out uh, an older age, hopefully maybe that uh, not necessarily mean that there's a, a kind of disillusionment or uh, some kind of nihilism or some kind of cynical or skeptical approach to life. Of course, sometimes, but, you know, I love to think about, uh, again, Eugenio Montale or uh, Giuseppe Ungaretti, who died at a very old age, and, uh, and they died very happy. And if you see their interviews, even to the very late moment of their lives, uh, or Alda Merini, who were mentioning a woman's a hero's journey. I think that Alda Merini says she's a wonderful poet, and her life was a kind of quite a quite a very very painful hero's journey. Uh, she's been, uh, you know, 
<clears throat> she's been closed in a in a mental facility and in an asylum for like 20 years at, and 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 rightly and unjustly only because back in those days when you had a you know a, some kind of mental breakdown or a nervous crisis that was like insanity so they close you in the asylum uh, so alda merini if you see her interviews she's still happy she's still uh, smiling and let me quote boccaccio when he talks about dante alighieri true uh, this is a true quote from boccaccio where he says that dante Fue homo luxuriosissimo infino alla tarda etate. So despite all the reference and his love for Beatrix and everything, Dante, until the very moment of his life, he loved the pleasure of life and all the pleasure and the pleasures that life can bring even to an old man. So I love to see the old age, maybe not that with that, uh, with that you know, kind of dramatic uh, or cynical disillusionment, but that's my point of view. And your, your analysis is absolutely right. Uh, maybe these three masterpieces, they're defining uh, the three ages of a man. Um, I mean, just uh, if I can again uh, jump in, uh, Max, as just uh, saying basically that potentially uh, we start with uh, being uh, uh, Odysse, uh, Odysse or Odysseus and, and then Turn into into Dante, and uh, and potentially we may end up uh, being Kurtz, um, you know, and maybe part of the experience is try not to become Kurtz. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And there is also Arthur Molella who asks, uh, and in part you have already answered, but let's see how uh, you could further uh, you know, explore this concept. If Dante had film technology available to him, do you think he would have been as great a filmmaker as he was a poet? Well, <clears throat> that's uh, the same kind of question that people are asking, you know, what if Mozart had the synthesizers and the samplers uh, and the modern music technology? Would it be like a, maybe like Skrillex or, you know, that mouse or would it be like Mozart anyway? Uh, I personally don't have a question. Uh, sorry, I don't have an answer to the question. What I personally think is that uh, maybe even if he had access to all the, the, the technology and the wonderful digital equipments and video uh, structure that you can have access right now as a filmmaker, well, the power of a word, it's still like uh, somehow um, unbeatable. Uh, let's not forget how the gospel of John begins. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. Now, <clears throat> word has to be intended as logos, Greek word, which means word, but also thought. It's the thought, el pensiero logos. Pensiero tradotto in parola. Pensiero che diviene parola. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. So the incarnation of the word, it's something that, uh, I'm sorry, as a filmmaker, for how much I love uh, the media that I use uh, to express myself, I'd say that it's uh, still uh, the most beautiful and relevant one. Well, I'm asking really, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is Molella talking. Uh, that uh, hi, very nice talk. Uh, since you're comparing a filmmaker to to a poet, I'm just wondering how uh, you know how Dante would stack up with uh, with uh, Apocalypse Now, that kind of thing. Oh, that's what of I'm talking course. about. Of course, yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> you you are comparing you know comparing different media, so I'm just wondering sure. how, you, how you put them together. That's all. <laughs> well, that was basically my my mental connection i tried i saw something uh, uh something that was speaking to me in the same way throughout the three works and now uh one thing that we have to think about think about the odyssey carved in stones uh, not even manuscripts uh, and later on uh, translated and transformed into manuscripts uh, and in the medieval age passed through like uh, monasteries and even more translated and tra uh, transferred into manuscripts. Uh, but still it's the word, it's the word. 
Now, I don't want to sound dramatic or, you know, uh, post-apocalyptic kind of guy, but let's, for example, for a minute, let's imagine that for a second, we don't have all of this. We don't have Zoom, computer, electricity, energy, nothing. The word gets back to its primal form of communication. It's this, this, you have nothing else. So I believe that still poetry remains one of the strongest form of expression ever, ever created. Uh, first, of course, in symbols, uh, carved in stones, uh, uh, hieroglyphs, uh, uh, you know, stone paintings. Uh. It's interesting. When I went uh, for the first time in 1999, when I went to Egypt, uh, and then I went to the tombs of the pharaohs, and I did all the tour, uh, play, and I saw uh, the Valley of the Kings, uh, and I went into the tombs of the pharaohs, all the paintings, uh, they... I, they struck me like a representation of the divine comedy so clearly, not to mention the fact that when you die, according to the Egyptian, of course, uh, religion, your soul has to be lighter than a feather. Interesting. There's a judgment after life, very similar. And there are some damned, condemned people and people who are saved. It, it, it was so, it struck me like, wow, this is the divine comedy 2000 years before the divine comedy. So it was really interesting uh, how this represents itself. Uh, uh, so to get back to the poetry, I love filmmaking, but again, if we wouldn't have all of this, probably all of us we would be sitting all around the fire, you know, projecting shadows on the stone or some, uh, some cave, and nothing would have changed. It's the same thing, the same vibration, the same story. It's only, so probably, I don't know how Dante would react to the apocalypse now. That doesn't mean that I don't appreciate, I mean, apocalypse now, but what is apocalypse now? If not like a kind of dream, a kind of beautiful, sumptuous dream that somebody wants to share with us on a very subliminal level. Well, the spoken word is before the written word, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carmelinda uh, has a comment first and then a question. Uh, Caro Max, this has been a brilliant talk. You have succeeded in presenting us with the numinosity of the moment you talked about earlier. Thank you. And how did Coppola end up getting Marlo Brando to play Kurt? <laughs> okay, now, I believe that maybe on YouTube, uh, somehow, if not entirely, you can see parts of darker... Heart of Darkness, which is the backstage that, uh, you know, Eleanor Coppola filmed through, you know, she filmed throughout the movie. And actually, I'm not joking. There's a point where his wife, uh, he's filming and he's sitting at a desk. Nothing is working. The set is destroyed. Brando is not coming on the set. Uh, he's losing his money. Warner Brothers, they cut the funds. He is desperate. Welcome to filmmaking, guys. Welcome to the worst job in the world but the most amazing at the same time. Anyway, uh, there's a moment in which he's like turned, he turns on the camera, his wife is filming and he says, you know what? I don't know, I, I don't know how, can I, how I can cope with this. I, I'm one step away from, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna take my life and, and she stopped filming. It's interesting, he says that on the set. Uh, so he was on the verge like of, of collapsing entirely. <clears throat> no, um, how he was able to get Brando on the set. In a very Brando way, Brando, he didn't say he was coming on the set. And Coppola, of course, he was trying to find right away some replacements. And he already contacted Al Pacino and Harvey Keitel to play the role of uh, Colonel Quartz. And he already contacted the, the both of them and somehow, Somebody told Brando in Hollywood that uh, Coppola was looking for a replacement for Colonel Quartz. Now think that Brando, he already got the money. So Brando calls Coppola on the set. He calls him and says, uh, 
he doesn't mention anything about Coppola trying to find replacement, whatever. He only says, well, if you pay me a little more money, I can show up on the set the next week. He doesn't say when, where, whatever, the day precisely. He just says, I'm going to come on the set. But you have to pay me some more money. He doesn't think about it twice. He prepares uh, like an international wiring of uh, $3 million. Uh, and think about that. Brando, he's been paid $15 million. And in the movie, he plays 15 minutes of movie. He is still nowadays the most well-paid actor in the world because he was paid $1 million for every minute of movie he played in. Now, a couple of cents the money, Brando doesn't answer, he doesn't say anything. And the week after, one day, all of a sudden, out of the blue, Brando shows up on the set with his assistant. <clears throat> oh, well, everybody's crying. He asks Coppola, like nothing happened. Like he never tried to not get on the set, whatever. Everything is fine. He arrives and Coppola says, okay, so Marlon, you know, let's uh, rehearse, uh, read, uh, you know, uh, um, and uh, the same night, he had an argument with Dennis Hopper over a stupid and silly misunderstanding about Heart of Darkness. Uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, he thought that Brando read the script, uh, he read the script, uh, and he already read the, also the novel that the script was taken or like loosely uh, inspired to. Uh, he didn't. And remember, we're talking about the late Brando. The late Brando, wouldn't even touch the script. Uh, true story. When Brando was filming The Godfather, he wanted all the other actors who were acting with him to wear, like, basically, in in big fonts, all the pieces, all the lines, all the all, uh, uh, all the signs that he has, to, all the lines he has to say in the movie, so that he could read them all the time. Don't you wonder why the late Brando, he's always with somebody on the screen with somebody because he has to read the lines. He wouldn't learn anything by heart. He wouldn't learn one word, one line. So he didn't read the script. He thought that Dennis Hopper was making fun of him. So the morning after he closed himself into the trailer and he doesn't get out. Same problem, Coppola cannot film anything. So the legend says that Coppola gets into the trailer he stays the whole day with Marlon. They're smoking joints, whatever. God know what they're doing. They're drinking, uh, making funds, whatever. <clears throat> and the night, Coppola gets out and says, tomorrow, uh, Marlon is going to film. But he doesn't want to, and it's true, uh, he doesn't want to be in the same uh, scene on the same set with Dennis Hopper. He hates Dennis Hopper. He doesn't want to be in the same scene with him. True story. You see, you never see Dennis Hopper together with Brando, not once. Always maybe in the foreground or something like that, but never together. Now, um, the thing is, um, Brando comes on the set and he says, I want to wear something black. He sh uh, oh, by the way, he arrived on the set with the long hair and a ponytail and everything. He shaved his hair. He completely, he was like bald completely. He comes on the set and he says, I'm, I want to wear something black. And he talks to Storaro and says, Vittorio, can you give me some like uh, lights and shadows? I, I don't want to show my body, just my face. I'm too fat. I hate myself. I don't want you to show my body. And Vittorio says, OK, not a problem. I can do this. So and that's how everything started. And that's how they made. And everything you, you hear, all the beautiful monologue, OK? the horror, the war, the children, norms and everything. Uh, and, 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 uh, and the fly that he was following something, he was choking. It's all true. It's all ad lib. He was improvising the whole time. There's not one line that was in the script. He wouldn't even take the, the script in his hands. This is an incredible story, Max. Thank you for that. Um, if there are no other questions, I think uh, it would be nice to uh, close this uh, uh, talk with uh, Stefano's comment on it. Thank you, an extraordinary ride.
through 3000 years to show us that with all the possible changes, man's path ultimately remains the same to undertake a journey that gives meaning to our presence here. Thank you, Max, for having taken us to the, through this journey of man and woman uh, across 3000 years of our life and of our history. And thank, thank you, you all of me. us, all of you for being here with us tonight. And we hope to see you again uh, for our next event, which will be on May 12th on portrait architecture. Thank you so much for everyone to be here with us. Grazie. Thank, thank you very thank you much. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you from the deep of my heart. Thank you very much for being here, guys. Thank you.